Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Candake, which means Queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants, for his life was taken from the earth? The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then. Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. So last week we heard about Philip in Samaria. Uh, how he preached the good news of Jesus, and many Samaritans believed, they were baptized, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. This week, Philip is away from the crowds, in the middle of nowhere, sharing the good news with one person. God sent an angel to Philip and told him to travel on the desert road that went from Jerusalem to Gaza, just so that he could meet that one Ethiopian official. Uh, there's this real revival going on in Samaria. Philip has an amazing ministry there, but God pulls him away from that uh, because there's one person in a remote place who is ready to give his life to Jesus. God is interested in that one person, and so God is interested in you specifically. I'd love it if hundreds or even thousands of people uh, came to faith uh, through the ministry of this church, St. Andrews. But if it turned out that it was all about just one person getting to know Jesus for the first time, it would be worth it. It's not about numbers. Now that phrase, it's not about numbers, can often be used as an excuse to be uh, lazy about evangelism and innovation. You know, we'll just keep doing the same thing we've always done, even though no one's coming to faith and the church is dying. We don't want to be that. That's really unhelpful because every number represents a person who needs to know Jesus, and we want as many people to be saved as possible. What I mean when I say it's not about numbers is we shouldn't despise being sent to that one person. Uh, we shouldn't be averse to spending a lot of time and energy in bringing one person to Christ. God deployed one of his best evangelists, Philip, to go to a remote place so that he could share the gospel with one man, who was willing to receive it with joy. So Philip traveled south from Samaria through Jerusalem uh, on towards Gaza, and at some point he met with this Ethiopian official, a eunuch. Uh, it's a grisly fact, fact that uh, court officials in the ancient Near East were often castrated. Uh, it was a very common practice. Uh, kings wanted to ensure that their courtiers could be trusted with the, male me with the female members of their household, which uh, could at that time, of course, include their harem. Uh, this particular official was extremely important because he was in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake. Uh, the Kandake is a title that was normally given to the queen mother 
who performed certain functions on behalf of the king. So this particular official was highly trusted. He was trusted uh, with senior female members of the royal household, and he was trusted with presumably what was a a huge fortune. And we understand that he was Jewish, uh, either through birth or conversion, we don't know, but we know he was Jewish because he went to Jerusalem to worship God. And he was on his way way back, he was uh, up there in his chariot, and he was reading from the book of Isaiah. Now, we know that the whole of the Old Testament points to Jesus. But if we were to pick the chapter that most obviously points to Jesus, Isaiah 53 is probably the one we'd pick. It's all about the suffering servant. And it speaks of Jesus' trial, his um, crucifixion, and his burial in explicit detail. And the spirit tells Philip, go to the chariot and stay near it. Whereupon Philip ran over to the chariot and he heard the Ethiopian reading aloud from Isaiah 53. By the way, it's uh, an interesting fact that uh, at this point in history, everybody read aloud. They hadn't actually discovered that you could read in your head. This sounds very strange to say it, but they didn't know that you could read in your head. They thought they had to verbalize everything that they read. It was only in the fourth century uh, that people actually began to read in their heads. Uh, it's one of those strange but true facts. Uh, and, and Philip says to the official, do you understand what you're reading? And he replies, well, how can I unless someone explains it to me? So um, he invites Philip to come up and sit with him. It's an open invitation. And Philip begins with that very passage of scripture that he was reading. And this is a great principle for evangelism, which is always starting where a person is at. With the scripture that they're reading, or the question that they're asking, or the situation that they're facing, we meet people where they are. Jesus often used the analogy of a harvest, and this Ethiopian official was ripe for the harvest. He only had to hear the gospel once, and he was ready to give his life to Jesus. Uh, Then they came across some water. Uh, God uh, provides, doesn't he? And uh, Philip baptized him there and then. And then verse 39 is quite intriguing. It says, when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. And the way that the Greek is written It could mean that Philip was miraculously taken away in an instant. And uh, I wouldn't, certainly wouldn't uh, rule that out. Uh, But equally, it could mean that the Spirit uh, took Philip away to Azotus in a more normal way. Uh, That is to say, Philip felt compelled to leave for Azotus as soon as the baptism had taken place. And then Philip's ministry continued from there until he reached Caesarea where he settled, but then he continued in ministry, uh, I assume, until the end of his days. But you know, there are similarities between this account of Philip and the Ethiopian and another story that Luke tells us. Do you remember how uh, when Jesus, uh, sorry, when those two uh, followers of Jesus were on the road to Damascus and Jesus met with them uh, and uh, he opened up the scriptures to them and showed them how the whole of the Old Testament pointed to him After that, he shared in a sacramental act, not baptism, but the breaking of bread. And as soon as their eyes were opened and they realized who Jesus was, he departed from them. He disappeared from their sight. So the same thing happens with Philip. He meets the Ethiopian uh, on the road, on a journey. He opened up the scriptures to him. He performed one of the sacraments, baptism, and then he departed straight away. So Philip is doing the work of Christ, unmistakably so, because we see such obvious parallels between these two accounts. You see, the baton had passed from Jesus to the church. So who's holding the baton now? It's us. We are called to do the work of Christ in the world. So my question for you this morning is, who has God put in front of you? Who has God brought you alongside? Philip was one of the first Christian missionaries, but there have been countless millions since. You know, if you're a Christian, 
you're a missionary. That doesn't mean uh, that God is going to take you off to Thailand or Iran or some other exotic place. He might do. But your mission field is here in Springfield with your family and your friends and your neighbors and your work colleagues. That's your mission field. If you don't see yourself as a missionary, you've missed something fundamentally important about the Christian message. Back in February, many of you completed the National Church Life Survey. Thanks for doing that. Uh, Together with the parish council, I've been scrutinizing the results. And overall, they're really encouraging. Uh, 92% of us feel a strong sense of belonging here at St. Andrews. 90% found it easy to make friends. Uh, A lot of people have said they love the sense of community, the belonging, the acceptance that, that they received, a warm welcome when they came here. And it's great that we are a warm, friendly, welcoming community. But that won't help us to grow unless there are people coming through that door for us to welcome in the first place. And that will only happen if we're out there inviting people. The survey highlighted many positive things about this church, uh, things that we're doing really well. Uh, But there are a few things that we're not doing so well uh, in, and uh, they all relate to evangelism. When it comes to the things we value, reaching those who do not attend church actually came in near the bottom. Only 22% of us feel at ease talking about our faith and look for opportunities to do so. 74% are willing to invite someone. That's really good. But only 41% actually did in the last year. So what's stopping the other 33% from inviting people? Or even the uh, 26% who said that they wouldn't necessarily invite someone in the first place. We need to get evangelism into the DNA of this church. That includes talking about our faith. It includes inviting people to our events, our services, and and into our homes. But I'd be the first to say this isn't easy. We live in a very secular culture. And it's not easy to talk about Jesus with people uh, who are not Christians. It's really hard. So we're going to identify some of the obstacles And maybe start trying to remove some of those obstacles that stand between us and sharing our faith with other people. So firstly, are we waiting for the perfect opportunity? We might read this account of Philip and the Ethiopian and think, well, Philip had the perfect opportunity. If I had opportunities like that, I'd be sharing my faith all the time. And it's true, everything about this situation was perfect. This Ethiopian was hungry for God. He had traveled more than a thousand miles to worship God in Jerusalem. He had a copy of Isaiah, the scroll. Uh, This is 1,400 years before the printing press was invented. Everything had to be copied by hand. Hardly anyone outside of Israel would have had a copy of this scroll. It was a rare and valuable item. He had one. And he just happened to be reading the passage that most obviously points to Jesus. I think all of this is God's providence. On top of that, the Ethiopian is humble and eager to learn. So in many respects, this was the perfect evangelistic opportunity. The equivalent for us would be walking around Springfield Lakes, and we come across a man sitting upon a bench, or a woman if we're a woman, and he's reading out loud from John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And he throws up his hands, he says, if only there was a Christian who could explain this to me. Sad thing is, a lot of Christians would still walk by him. But let me tell you, that's not going to happen. I mean, it could do, it's not beyond the realms of possibility, but I wouldn't hold your breath. So I think we can see that Philip had the perfect evangelistic opportunity. But we have to ask ourselves, why did he have this opportunity In the first place, well, he availed himself to God. He had an evangelistic heart. He longed to see Jesus glorified and people saved. When God said, go, he went. When the Spirit said, draw near, he ran over to that chariot. It wasn't by chance that he had this opportunity. 
He gave his heart, his life, and his time to God. He longed to do Christ's work. He looked for opportunities to share the good news of Jesus. You know what? I think if we take a leaf out of Philip's book, we might find that we have more opportunities than we thought. It's not a perfect opportunity we need. It's a change of heart. The next potential obstacle is apathy. This is just not really being that bothered, not seeing uh, evangelism, sharing our faith, not just not seeing it as a pri- priority, as something we need to do. So I th- sometimes think we need to recapture the importance and the urgency of the gospel. Now, there's a tendency in some modern Western churches to avoid at all costs using the word hell. I don't use the word very often. Because this, this is the, the, the idea that some people are eternally separated from God, or could be, is not palatable, particularly in our culture. I think it was D.L. Moody who said uh, that no one should ever preach on the subject of hell without a tear in their eye. And I agree with that. But we shouldn't avoid the subject altogether. Jesus certainly didn't. I've recently got a copy of the Infographic Bible. It's a, it's a, um, a series of uh, pictures, diagrams, uh, images that convey key information from the Bible. If you're a visual learner, then uh, the Infographic Bible is a, is, a, is a great thing to get your hands on. And one of the diagrams I find most interesting is the top 50 subjects Jesus taught on. Out of 50 subjects, God's judgment comes in at number six. Jesus had a lot to say about the consequences of sin. We cannot get away from that. It's all very well telling people they need to be saved, but we've got to be up front about what we're being saved from. There is a real spiritual danger with eternal consequences. Now, I'm not saying that we should all go around preaching hellfire and brimstone to everyone that we meet. I'm simply saying that we need to be aware that there is a reality that people need saving from. Why else do we see that word salvation so many times in the New Testament? And actually, it's right there as a thread throughout the Old Testament. This is a bit of a comedy example. But if you saw a couple stood on a street corner chatting... And above them was suspended a grand piano, 30 foot above their heads. And it was uh, being suspended by a very frayed looking rope that looked like it could give way at any moment. And you'd seen it and they hadn't. Wouldn't you at least say something? Wouldn't you warn them? And you might say, well, God doesn't need me to save people. God will save those that God will save. Uh, That's his job. But did you notice that God sent an angel to Philip? to tell him to go to this certain point where he would meet with the Ethiopian official. God could have just as easily sent the angel straight to the Ethiopian. He could have cut out the middleman. Philip didn't even need to be involved. The only explanation is that God wanted to use Philip to draw that Ethiopian into the kingdom. And God wants to use you and me in exactly the same way. The good news of Jesus is the most important thing that anybody can ever hear. It is life-changing, both in the present and for all eternity. Rather than apathy, we should have a sense of urgency about sharing it. The next obstacle to sharing the gospel is awkwardness. If we lived in Iran or China or northern Nigeria, I'd be talking about severe persecution But for us, it's just awkwardness. You might say, well, it does feel a bit weird. It feels a bit awkward to talk about Jesus with a non-Christian. But think about Philip's situation. He went up to a total stranger, someone from a different nationality, uh, race, culture, a rich and powerful government official. This would have been an intimidating person. There's all kinds of opportunities for awkwardness there, aren't there? Rest assured, if you share or continue to share the gospel, uh, you'll face some very awkward situations. You, or at the very least your message, will be rejected 
often. But sometimes you'll get a positive response from somebody like that Ethiopian who's ready to give his or her life to Jesus. Or you might play a part in the process of bringing a person to that point. It might be someone else that reaps a harvest. And you never know who that person will be. Often, it might be the least likely person, the person that you would be most uncomfortable sharing your faith with. Think about that person now. Who is the person you would be most uncomfortable sharing your faith with? That could be the very person who's ready to give their life to Christ. So we have to be willing to experience a bit of awkwardness. And actually, the more we share our faith, the less awkward it will be. The next obstacle might be a feeling of inadequacy. It might be, well, you know, I'm not a very good example of a Christian, or I don't know my Bible well enough, or I'm not very articulate. But, you know, most of the time when we're sharing our faith, we're not being asked to explain difficult passages from the Bible. There are so many ways to share the gospel. One of the most effective is testimony. Being able to explain what God has done in our lives is a powerful tool for evangelism. It doesn't have to be our whole life story either. It can be something that God has done in the last week. A while ago, someone was uh, telling me about a situation that they were really thankful to God for. And um, I said, that's an amazing testimony. And the person said, well, I didn't really think of it as being a testimony. We should get used to, do, to talking about what God is doing in our life, what God is doing in the church, what God is doing in the world. We should get used to talking about our experience of God. You know, people can refute and argue with all kinds of things, but it's very hard to argue with someone's testimony because you'd be saying, well, you didn't experience that, but you know, somebody's experience is their experience. That's why testimony can be so powerful. And everyone can share a testimony. It doesn't matter what stage you're at of your Christian journey. It doesn't matter how well you know your Bible or not, although I'd always encourage you to get to know it better. It, it doesn't uh, matter how articulate you are or not. God can use you, and he will do, if you're willing to speak out. The final obstacle to sharing the gospel is time. Uh, you might be thinking, well, it's all right for Philip. He didn't have anything else to do. Not sure what we base that on, but um, might think like that. You might be thinking, well, I just haven't got time for this sort of thing. I haven't got the headspace. But it's not even about how we prioritize our time. You don't really need to set aside time for evangelism. It's more of a case of just making use of the opportunities that come to us every day. The most effective evangelism happens through normal, everyday relationships and interactions. We love people. That's what we're called to do. We love people. We love them into the kingdom. But we also tell them the good news of Jesus. We do both. At the end of the day, if we think that sharing our faith is important enough, we'll do it. We'll find a way. We'll do it. If we don't think it's important enough, we won't do it. But actually, it's also one of the quickest ways to grow in the Christian faith. If you ever feel like you're stagnating a bit, like you're treading water, there's, there's nothing more powerful than allowing the Spirit to speak through you, to work through you, and to know that that, that, that process is happening. It's, very, it's the most exciting thing that we can experience, to work in partnership with the Holy Spirit. And at times to see lives completely changed and transformed because of it. So God used Philip to reach out to one person who was ready to give his life to Jesus. And God wants to use us in exactly the same way. So my question to you this morning is who has God put in front of you? Who has God put in front of you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you would send Philip to one person who is in the middle of nowhere. And you would send us to one person who doesn't yet know you. We pray, Lord, that we can 
we will love people, that we, we will be seen to be different in the way that we live our lives, in our concern and our compassion uh, for others. Help us to tell the story of your love, but help us also to speak the truth of the gospel, to point people towards your son, Jesus Christ, and the salvation that is possible through him. We pray, Lord, that you give us a great boldness to do this and the, the heart for it as well, Lord, the willingness to go when, when you say go, the willingness to draw near where, when your spirit says draw near. Help us, Lord, to be obedient to you, no matter how awkward and difficult it might be at times. And we ask this in your name, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, by your power and love, you have created and redeemed us. Strengthen us in your spirit, that we may give ourselves this day in service and compassion to one another and to you, and share your gospel of love and hope in all we say and do. Through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Loving God, we bring before you in prayer the concerns and the joys of our hearts this day. It is with joyful hearts we thank you that we are now able to worship together again. Thank you for all the people involved in parishes and especially here at St Andrews that are working hard to make this happen in safe ways, especially Reverend Charlie, Tissa and all the parish council. Help us to be patient and mindful of each other Strengthen us to remain faithful to you and your word in our lives. God of grace, hear our prayer. It is with troubled hearts that we hold before you your world and your people and pray for all that are so affected by the coronavirus. We pray for your help that this virus may be controlled and overcome. Please guide and help all who are developing vaccines and remedies. We pray for countries overseas that are overcome by incredible numbers of those ill. We pray too for our country and especially for all in Victoria where the virus is spreading so rapidly. We pray for healing for all who are ill and for protection for those who have not contracted the virus. Be with all who are scared and anxious, for all who have lost jobs and businesses, for those in lockdown situations. We pray that people will take good heed of the advice and restrictions and be mindful of one another, especially those who are more vulnerable. Thank you for the doctors and nurses tending to people and for police and defence personnel helping to keep people safe. We pray for and give thanks for all the volunteer associations trying to help people with food and other benefits. Thank you for the extraordinary acts of love and kindness and compassion that occur every day. Please help goodness and blessing to arise from this pandemic and that we may learn the good lessons you are calling us to learn, to place our faith and trust in you and find new and positive ways to move forward. God of grace, hear our prayer. We pray for all countries where natural disasters, wild weather events and tragic accidents have also taken a toll on the people. We pray for all the refugees and asylum seekers, for the stateless and the homeless, that good and safe accommodation may be found for them. We continue to pray for all who are affected by drought in this land and for those who still await help after the devastating fires. May they not be forgotten. We pray for the leaders of the nations, for good and wise government of their peoples, and we particularly pray for our Prime Minister Scott Morrison and all politicians, and especially our state premiers. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of compassion, we pray for healing for all we know, and especially for all in this parish who are ill, and for those who walk with them. Especially we pray for Reverend Rick Gummo and for Tracy. We pray for those who have lost loved ones and for comfort and solace for them and for your loving presence in their grieving. 
God of grace, hear our prayer. Holy God, through your spirit, give us courage as you gave it to the first apostles, that we may faithfully witness to our Lord Jesus Christ's gospel of love and peace in every circumstance of life. You are the light of the minds that know you, the joy of the hearts that love you, and the strength of the wills that serve you. Inspire us so to know you that we may truly love you, and to love you that we may fully serve you, whom to serve is perfect freedom. In Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen.